Well, welcome to World Ocean Day. My name is James. I work in the Education Department at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. We're going to celebrate and learn about the World Ocean today. I'm glad you could join me because we're going to have a lot of fun discussing the special variety of habitats that you can find all over the ocean. We're going to start in this place, though, because it's one of my favorites that we have here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. This is a live view of our webcam in our Tropical Pacific Gallery. Now, this exhibit is designed to be modeled just like a dive site in the southwestern Pacific. And we'll show you a little bit more about that area and why this area can be like this. What makes a coral reef so special? How do you get coral reefs in certain areas of the ocean? We'll also take a look at some other places around the world ocean to examine what makes them so different from each other. How did they get that way? But let's first make some observations together in this space. This is a little different than our backyard ocean here in Southern California. We don't quite get the same stuff over here. What do you notice inside? What have you seen so far in our tropical Pacific exhibit? Now we lovingly call this Big Trop, but it's designed to look like Blue Corner an actual corner of a coral reef where you can find the big animals and the small animals hanging out together. So right at the edge of this barrier reef, there's this current that goes past this little edge of the coral. And in this space, a lot of the little animals that hang out in the coral here, you might see like these little blue and yellow fish hiding in the coral down here. And the bigger animals that might sometimes be pelagic or open ocean animals come into the edge of the reef. Who do you think might have been out in the open ocean and come to the edge here? Hmm. Now, those unicorn fish right in the middle there, they probably like to hang out in the coral reef most of the time. But ooh, what about the sharks? Now, that zebra shark might hang out near the reef most of the time because it likes to feed from the seafloor or below itself more often than an animal if we had like black tip reef sharks or even bigger sharks that would be more open ocean animals and they were in here, that's more like what that role or that part of their job in the ecosystem would be coming from. Now, like we said, we want to look at why the coral reefs are the way they are. What makes them so special? How do we get coral reefs? Why are there so many various habitats in our world ocean? Now, if you're watching the other program we were doing today, we drew animals from the open ocean. So we're going to look a little more coastal for this pro uh, presentation. Let's take a little bit closer look. Where is Blue Corner? Well, you know, I have a handy tool with me here. We're going to be using a special app called the SOS Explorer. Now, this is developed by NOAA, and I have it here on my iPad. My friend Alicia is going to help put this up here so we can see what's going on. Because if you don't know where this special habitat is, it's kind of hard to understand how you get that habitat. Well, this view should look pretty familiar for most of you that are living in the western half of the world. But that's not where Blue Corner is. We need to spin this around a little bit. Like, okay, maybe a lot of it. A little bit more over this way. Have you found it yet? Oh, I'm sure it's tough because it's a tiny little island in the southwestern Pacific. It's pretty easy to find our home or our habitats with our part of the ocean. But out here, it's a little different. Now, I'm going to take away the clouds so it makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on. So, take away the daytime, nighttime, take away the clouds. Now we can see all of the land structures. So, Palau is the island that Blue Corner, our exhibit, the real Blue Corner dive site would be based off of. It's in this area near what we call the Coral Triangle. So I'm going to spin our planet a little bit more. Whoop. Hope it didn't make you motion sick. Now, the triangle is right here. It's a special area where there's a lot of islands in this space that give us a lot of coastal habitat for a coral reef to grow. But what are the conditions that you need a coral reef to grow in? Because we have a coral, we have a coastal co space here, but we don't really have a coral reef. Do you know what makes coral reefs grow in the area they're in? 
Well, we've got lots of space. We've got lots of water. But what's the really special part? We need clear water that is warm, and we need a lot of things going on in that water, meaning lots of currents. If special conditions for the coral to grow, too, where it needs to grow on something special. It can't just show up. It has to exist as a planktonic, free-floating form. First, land on somewhere where there's actually some red coralline or crustose algae, so it can munch on that, and then it can grow. So you can't get coral just anywhere just because it's warm. I mean, it gets pretty warm here in Southern California, but that's not the right ocean condition for coral to grow. Let's add some information to our planet. Let's go back to Tropical Reef while I help add some data to our planet here so we can learn a little bit more about the conditions that this stuff, live coral, is going to grow in. Now, this app that I'm using, anybody can download to their phone or tablets. It's actually pretty fun to play with a little bit, learn a little bit more about your world ocean right in the palm of your hand. So these coral here, all these different species, the fish, they all really rely on the conditions that exist in that area. Now, for us to rebuild or replicate something like a coral reef, you can see it's kind of blue. We have to put special lighting in there so it resembles a lot more of their natural lighting. And with cameras, it just comes out very blue. Well, we also have high flow. With live coral like these, we have to produce enough algae or not algae, uh, plankton for them to consume for their animal bodies to be able to survive. But then the algae that lives inside of them need the light source that we've provided so that they can produce a healthy habitat. Yes, each coral has a little algae body living inside of it. It's called zooxanthellae. You should try saying it. It's one of my favorite science words to say. Zooxanthellae. So if you looked really close in here, you, we'd still need a microscope because they're pretty small. This is the whole body. See all these little moving tentacle parts? That's a whole body of one coral animal. They live as a colony, and then deep inside of them, there's the zooxanthellae. So these tentacles have a job. What do you think tentacles are good for? Besides having fun. Grabbing stuff. They grab their food. Now, most coral like this are eating at night, and then the zooxanthellae during the day is producing energy for both of them. It's like having a roommate that gives you all the energy and you give it home kind of rent-free. Well, that's the relationship that zooxanthellae and coral have. So they need lots of light in order for that to work out. If these types of coral don't have enough light, they won't survive. So we can't find this kind of coral deep in the ocean. There is a deep ocean coral, but that's a very different kind of thing. But this kind of coral needs a lot of sunlight and needs enough plankton to survive. Too much plankton, it clouds the water too much, and they're not going to have enough light to survive. So that's one of the things that's a little bit different between our ocean backyard and their ocean backyard. Their water is very clear for lots of light to come through, warmer waters, and let's take a look at what's going on in that ocean space. Let me go back to my iPad. So if we're still looking at this southwestern Pacific, we've added a lot of information to this planet. We kind of grayed out or darkened all of the uh, continental space, but you know what? There you go. Now you can see where those things are. But what is all the rest of this doing? What was your first impression as you saw all of this going on? Is the water really these colors? No, this is a false color representation of a huge database. And instead of showing you tons of numbers, the people over at NOAA figured out that we can use visual representations to make this much more meaningful. So you can see all of these currents, all the motion going in, on in the water. But also, if you notice down here, we have a temperature scale. So where do you see some of the warmest water? I'm going to move our planet around a little bit while I'm off screen. Let's zoom out a tiny bit. Because, you know what? If we spin this around, we can take a little bit, little, little bit different look at the whole Pacific. It's a big ocean, so there's a lot of space to try and take a look at. 
Now the video does replay, so it just started from the beginning, which is why it seemed like it jumped. And at different times of the year, we'll see different amounts of the different colors in here. So just like you might see on any color temperature scale, red is the warmest. We got a lot of red over here. We've got some yellow and green showing up on this side. And if you're watching Little Date Marker, well, we're getting into fall slash winter for North America or North, the Northern Hemisphere, including North America. So let's take a quick look. What's different between our ocean and theirs? You know, we could even get a little bit flatter view if you want to look at everything together. If we're looking at our ocean backyard right there and their ocean backyard about ish right here. What do you first notice is a difference? The color. There's a whole lot more red and orange on this side than up where we are at. Now, if we were looking at right here, there's a lot of orange and red in there too. In fact, if we looked at a lot of the planet, in this band right here, there's lots of orange and red. So watch as the video keeps playing. There's a whole lot of orange and red right here. Not just our coral triangle right there. Well, this middle band, this equatorial region, between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, you're going to find most, about 99% of all, surface coral reefs. The deep ocean reefs, remember, we're going to leave those in for a different discussion. Almost all of the surface coral reefs are in this band right here. It needs the special ocean conditions for lots of light, which the equator is good for, clear water, which is really important over here, and those temperature variants we're looking at. So if we have lots of sunlight here, can we get lots of coral? Hmm. My iPad needs to be backed up. That's okay. It can wait till after the presentation. Well, let's take a look at a local habitat and let's see what might be different from what we first observed in our tropical coral reef space. Now we have a couple of kelp forest habitats here at the aquarium. Our biggest one is called Blue Cavern. We also have another one called Amber Forest. So if you imagine some of these spaces mixed together, we get a very complete picture of what's going on. But in order to make the animals happy, we had to split them up into a couple spaces. And that's okay. Well, what do you notice is different here? Hmm. I, don't, I don't quite see the same animals, do you? Not really. I see a lot of similarities. There's rocks. There's a lot of stuff in there. There's big animals and small animals, although most of them are hiding at the moment. Oh, wait. Small animals way up there. Oh, we found some. Okay, good. So now we know we have small animals, big animals, and a shark. And then, wait, who's this fun little character that decided to say hello? California moray eels. So there's a lot of diversity in both spaces. Coral reefs have a little bit more diversity, though. So as you can see, there's just a different amount of different species. But there's a lot of the same infrastructure or foundation to this ecosystem. They both have, well, one, water. That works for aquatic habitats. They have a lot of rock layering in the bottom. But the, there's no coral. Instead, this has kelp. The kelp is the thing that everybody lives with. What was everybody living on in or around in the other habitat? coral. The coral reef is that foundation. It actually grows the habitat itself. Whereas the kelp, if you ever walked by a kelp, touched it or on the, on the, on the beach one day, not quite, as, not quite the same. But it is the important foundation for this ecosystem. Everything lives by this stuff. Everything relies on it. It produces a lot of the oxygen, not only for the animals, but for everybody on the dry side too. But it is the home for their babies, for them to live in, it creates all these different spaces for the varieties of animals to live in a kelp forest habitat. But one of the things that you might have seen in the kelp wavy video, not just the ocean wave action, that's pretty normal, that happens all over the ocean. Take a look at this, is this as clear and 
what you might describe as clean. It's not dirty, but it doesn't have the same clarity, does it? Well, that's the big difference between a kelp forest like we have and a coral reef out in the other spaces. Plankton. There's a lot of plankton here. There's not a lot of plankton in the coral reef. Remember, we said they need lots of light, more than we have here. This is really pretty. Not quite enough light to support a coral reef. So just because we might have some similar latitude, your north or south position, some similar wave action, you really have to have some special conditions. You need different amounts of light and plankton going on in the water. Well, let's go back to our blue cavern. So now that we know what a live kelp forest looks like, we're going to go to our replicated kelp forest. Now, even though this isn't live kelp, don't tell the fish, they don't mind. It gives them the feel of a real habitat. Or like we saw the amber forest habitat with a little bit of wave action, we can replicate some of the conditions that these lovely animals are waiting to see. This gives them all the conditions that they need as if they were in the kelp forest in our ocean backyard. Well, besides a little bit of light and a lot of plankton, did you see on that map what was a little bit different? Kind of helps us understand a little bit more about our weather too. So I'm going to go back to the iPad real quick. And I'm going to put it back into a sphere. And let's take a quick look at our ocean backyard. So here's our amber forest exhibit we're showing you while Alicia trades over to our iPad. And if we zoomed out to space and had special temperature goggles on, this is what we would see. So as the, we watch the currents move and the temperatures change slightly for our Southern California region, this area along our west coast of North America has a lot of kelp. It's a really, really popular habitat for people to dive and snorkel through. So we don't have quite the temperature necessary to grow that coral reef. And instead, we have this cold current that this overall current pushes cooler water down this way, and it carries with it lots of plankton. Now, plankton is really important for everybody else that lives here. But remember, too much plankton in the water uh, and different temperature conditions, different latitudes, you might not get the same habitat space. So if we looked at our east coast of North America, as well as our west coast, we get some varied spaces here. Now, because of this current that's very warm that comes out of the Gulf, it changes some of the weather over here in the temperatures. So if you drew a line straight across to Southern California, we don't quite have the same conditions. Our planet is very active and very dynamic. And because of that, we get some pretty unique spaces and ecosystems along the way. Now, the other interesting thing is not only do we have varied habitats like kelp forests and coral reefs, out here they have a lot more hurricane action. There's a continental shelf, a big flat space underneath the surface of the water that we just don't have here. So on our west coast of North America, it doesn't have the same effect. So all of these variables, all these different things that you would notice on our planet can create very unique habitats. Let's zoom back out. As we are the Aquarium of the Pacific, let's take another big look, too far, of the Pacific Ocean. Spin back this way, Eric. Okay. So the dynamic action within this planet really creates some really special spaces for us to explore. Let's keep exploring inside the aquarium a little bit because there's a lot more to learn about our world ocean by using our example exhibit spaces here. Let's take a look at some of the animals that live in these areas. I think we should look at who eats coral, because they're a really special animal. There's a lot of things that eat kelp, even though it's the foundation, the infrastructure. There's urchins that eat kelp, but there's other things that eat coral. Just because coral is kind of rocky and tough doesn't mean they're not going to have a little bit of an effect. Now, if you recognize this fish, go ahead and say it out to the screen you're watching from. You could be at your TV computer, phone, iPad, 
Who is this fish? The parrotfish. Think of a couple fun things you might know about parrotfish. What did you come up with? Well, they, they don't have a parrot beak, so how do they get the name parrotfish? Well, they do have a hard structured mouth like this. So we looked at the conditions that make a coral reef a coral reef, but let's look at the fun animals that live there. This parrotfish has a huge effect on the coral reef. But what is that effect? Did you say one of the fun things, that they eat coral? They do eat coral. Now, they're not really eating the coral because they want to eat the coral. They might eat some coral and digest it. They're trying to get the algae and other things that grow on top of the coral. So this is another relationship. There's a little algae body, the zooxanthellae, inside the coral animal, and that provides a symbiotic, positive relationship. But then there's this fish that also helps the coral reef. Now this is our bicolor parrotfish. It's not, this is not to scale. It's not six feet. It's about, mm, about 20 inches. Now it's a big fish and it's very strong jaws would be able to chew the algae off of the surface of coral, but it unfortunately would also eat some of the coral in that process. It's like, no, not the coral. That's the pretty part. That's where the fish live. Hold on. It's an interesting relationship where the animals that chew on the coral help it grow. How could chewing off some of the surface of the coral help it grow? What do you think is important in that relationship? Now, there's a lot of other fish that live with our bicolor parrotfish in here. And just about everybody's hiding because they knew I wanted to talk about them. Always how it works. There he is. Way back there. Well, how could chewing on the surface of the coral help it grow? Well, remember, we need lots of sunlight in a coral reef. If there's algae covering the coral, is that going to be helpful? Not the little zooxanthellae, other algae growing all over the top. If you've ever had a home aquarium before, you might understand what this does. That can block some of the light from getting to the coral. So a lot of these animals are herbivores. The parrotfish is not an herbivore since it might accidentally eat coral. It's an omnivore in that case, but not really intending to eat lots of coral. He's hiding up at the top. So a lot of these other animals will eat just a little bit of the algae. They help clear some of the algae off. Well, this fish will help clear off some of the algae, but also chew off some of the coral, which provides a new space. Remember we said that coral starts as this planktonic thing that has to land somewhere? If there's no space to land and grow, it kind of stops some of the coral growth. Coral grows in a couple different ways. Either they chew off a little bit, things land at a new open spot and they can grow new coral, or the coral can clone itself and keep growing into new branches of that coral piece. So like we were looking at some of the other coral habitat space, all of those branches and bulbs and flat stretchy parts, those are lots of individuals and they can clone or asexually reproduce and grow one big coral body. Now this big pink space right here, 20-ish years ago when we opened this exhibit, it was like this big. It's now huge. It's a massive coral in there. Well, natural disruption, like animals eating chunks of coral, storms breaking off some of the coral, actually helps improve some of the growth of the coral. Scientists actually figured out when we try to regrow coral, if we break it down into small chunks, it can grow back faster than if we didn't. The smaller the chunk, the faster the initial phase of growth was. So that's a good adaptation in an area that gets a lot of storms. Those coral reef spaces are susceptible to lots of storms. And in fact, this reef, if it were out in the ocean, would be the protection for our coastline that we like to live on. It's a wave break. It stops a lot of that energy before it gets to the coastline. Because of that, it tends to damage some of the coral during every big storm but it's grown back, if that storm is not so damaging to break down a lot of the coral, it can grow back at a reasonable rate of a few inches a year at most. Depends on the coral species. Some of them, the softer corals might grow back faster. Some of these big hard corals like this, they grow, 
maybe a pinky width per year. So not a lot. But that natural disruption of storms and wave action is part of their normal habitat. Well, let's compare that real quick to the kelp forest and how it helps our coastal habitats. Because it has to survive coastal disruption like storms and other things. But when you look at this, is this algae going to be as resistant to wave action as coral is? Probably not. Now, for those of you that have walked along the beach and found a piece of seaweed, did you ever pick it up? Get past the slimy part. How easy is it to break it? It doesn't take a ton of energy. Kelp can break off pretty easily, which is why after a lot of big storm action, you can walk along the beach here in Southern California and see lots of kelp washed up on the beach. It's called rec algae or rack algae. So the broken off seaweed that washes up, before it washes up, it's actually still alive. So even if it broke off right there and this whole kelp floated away, it's still alive and it can still have a positive effect on that ecosystem. But it's not going to be able to resist the same amount of wave energy that a coral reef does. So there's other things in our local ocean backyard right here in Southern California that create that rocky reef structure to help with the breaking the wave action. Or we have man-made structures like a break wall to help protect our coastlines from that effect. But if you went out to Catalina Island <laughs> and you went diving in the water, this would be a lot closer to what you would see. There's no barrier reefs built up by the kelp. The kelp is part of that energy break, but it's a little bit more homestead than rock wall to help protect that island. So if we went to Catalina and we were diving in this effect, what kinds of things can you see the kelp having the effect on. So we said that things eat the, the coral. It's good for the coral. It takes a little while to grow back. But what, you remember what we said it eats the kelp? There's a lot of things that live on the sea floor that might eat the kelp. There's a few of the fish that might eat the kelp too. But there's a lot of invertebrates that are probably going to eat our kelp forest. Kelp forest can be very tall, too. One giant piece of kelp could be 100, 150 feet tall. Well, if a few urchins decide that that looks like a tasty snack, they'll chew right through the kelp hold fast, and then that free-floating kelp floats away. How long does it take for 150 feet of kelp to grow back when it took coral a year to grow that much? Well, kelp has adapted a way to regrow much faster than coral. Kelp can grow up to two to three feet per day in the best conditions. In so-so conditions, still at least six to 12 inches. So if there's a heavy storm or animals that might eat some of the kelp, it can grow back pretty quickly to restore that coastal ecosystem that we would see here. But this kind of comes back to the first things we're talking about, the conditions that kelp grows in. Kelp needs a lot of algae or, well, planktonic algae. You need that plankton in the water to help grow some of our ecosystem. Now they start as little free-floating plankton too. So they're a juvenile floating around as a little dot in the ocean. They have to land somewhere and start growing. But they need the cooler temperatures in order to really have that good growing condition along with nutrients in the water. So it's not just plankton that's floating around. There's a lot of nutrients in the water that come from our deep ocean. Cold currents push it up and that helps start this ecosystem. When we were looking at the map with the currents and the colors on it, we were kind of the green-blue color. What if we were too much in the yellow and red? Well, that actually changes the ecosystem. If it's too warm, the nutrients that kelp needs to grow really isn't there. So it can't grow that two to three feet per day. So when things come by and break off some of this kelp, it's going to take a lot longer for that ecosystem to recover. Well, think about the coral reef. If there's too much plankton and material in the water, too many nutrients blocking the light, it's not going to grow back very easily. It grows slowly to begin with. So if it makes it even, makes it tough for that stuff to grow back, that ecosystem is going to take many, many, many years to recover. So let's think about what we can do to help our world ocean. We know some of the conditions that are good for these things. 
we want to make good decisions that help create a healthy future for our ocean backyard, whether you're here in Southern California, off the coast of Palau, or anywhere in the world. So I challenge you on World Ocean Day to start thinking of things that you can do from anywhere on the planet that might help our world ocean. What could you do? Maybe you can get your friends involved, your neighbors, maybe people at school with you. Well, there's a lot we can do. If all of us have a little bit of impact together, it's a huge effect. Now, the other thing to think about, in order to protect our world oceans, we don't all have to do it perfectly. As long as we're doing a little bit to help out, the world ocean will be the better for it, and these beautiful habitats with all the lovely animals we've seen today will be that much healthier during those times of natural disruption. Well, thank you so much for joining me as we explore the world ocean on World Ocean Day. And please stay tuned to our website. There's a lot of fun things going on today. And I challenge you to help in any way you can the world ocean today.